Amen. Good morning. If you'll take your Bible and turn with me to John 21, um, I am going to both tie up the book of John and launch us into Acts this morning. Um, I've got a lot to get my arms around. Um, I'm going to be in the very end of John 21, verse 15. We're going to go all the way to verse 25. But what I want to do is invite you this morning uh, to join with me on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And if we were there this morning, uh, there's a special little place called Mensa Christi. And at Mensa Christi, there's actually a jetty um, that sticks out into the water. And it would have been on this jetty that Jesus would have sat. And I want to invite you into this moment because on the Sea of Galilee at dawn, um, the sun, there's mountains to the left. If we're looking south on the Sea of Galilee, there'd be mountains to the left. And the sun would just be rising and uh, the, the streams of light would just be coming coming over those mountains, and King Jesus, Christ Jesus, the now resurrected but not yet ascended King Jesus, was sitting around a campfire, and he was preparing uh, bread for his disciples. He was roasting fish for his disciples. He had water there for his disciples. And we've just seen Peter and John and a number of the other disciples who were out fishing all night. They've spotted him from out in a boat. And Peter, it was really John who first said, Peter, it's the Lord. And Peter would have had a loincloth on fishing all night. They would have been cold and wet and tired. They'd caught absolutely nothing, so they were probably somewhat discouraged or frustrated. And Peter grabbed his clothing and his cloak, and he jumped in the water. And he was so excited to swim to Jesus, so he swam up to this little stone jetty, and he would have crawled out of the water, and he would have sat down around this fire. So the birds would have been chirping at dawn, and the, the, the darkness is moving away, and the light is rising and King Jesus is sitting there and it appears there's very few words exchanged and Peter is cold and he is downcast, he is downtrodden, he has recently betrayed his Lord, not once not twice, but three times and so he's now sitting around this campfire and if, P if Jesus was here and Peter's sitting around the fire then behind them was the disciples and the disciples were rowing or sailing their way to shore to be with Jesus and with Peter and I can only imagine that Peter is now shivering from the cold water of the Lake of Galilee. He's probably taking his cloak off and he's drying it around the fire. He smells uh, the, the roasted bread and even the fish that the Lord Jesus is providing. And it occurs to me that he grew up. Peter actually um, was born and, and uh, raised in Bethsaida, which is less than six miles from where they were sitting on this little stone jetty called Mensa Christi. And it, it was actually less than a mile from where Peter's house was in in Capernaum. And it was on this almost same spot just up the hill that Peter had just recently witnessed King Jesus take five crusty loaves of bread and two fish and break them and give thanks and use them to feed 5,000 men and more women and children, probably 12 or 13,000 people. And I can only imagine that as Peter is sitting there that he is filled with all of these memories going back to his childhood and him as a young man. And he's still a young man, 18, 19, 20 probably at this point. And he's sitting there with Jesus, recollecting Jesus, breaking the bread, breaking the fish, distributing them, feeding the 5,000. It's also less than a mile from where Peter first saw Jesus. And Jesus, for the very first time, said, Peter, go out into deeper water and let out your nets for a catch in Luke 5, verse 4. And Peter did it, and he caught so many fish after fishing all night and not catching anything. And then Peter was like, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. So Jesus is coming back to this place where Peter has known, and it is been known to Peter. He has been humbled there. He has seen Jesus work there. In fact, in this spot that they're sitting in Mensa Christi on the northern part of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus actually did 18 months of his three years of public ministry. He did more supernatural signs and wonders in this area than anywhere else. And then to fill out the picture even further, you have Peter uh, who has just declared braggadociously before all of his disciples or all of Jesus' disciples that he's going to go with Jesus to death. No matter what. And then when push comes to shove, when he's put on the spot, aren't you one of the disciples when Jesus is being actively crucified? He says, no, not once, not twice, but three times. 
and he actually denied Jesus around a fire. And what is amazing to me is that Jesus calls Peter back to a fire. So the same smoke, the same crackle of wood. And before Jesus even deals with Peter's um, spiritual state and his heart, he allows Peter to relax. He allows him to get warm. He gives him some bread and some fish and some water. He takes care of his, his um, physical needs. He loves on him. He ministers to him. He takes care of him. And I think we immediately get this picture of the kindness of the Lord Jesus the generosity of the Lord Jesus, um, and the invitation of the Lord Jesus to know him more deeply and fully. So we have uh, Peter sitting here by this fire, and here's, here's what I want to like wrestle with you this morning. Um, I, I actually called this message a faith crisis and a reconstruction, because Peter is at a moment of absolute faith crisis. And I want you to like come with me as we go through this passage and watch as, as Jesus leads Peter through a faith crisis, through even some deconstruction to some reconstruction, um, and then he appoints and anoints Peter as the first pastor of the first church in Jerusalem. And then more than that, he equips and calls Peter to usher in Pentecost, which is the fullness of the release of the Spirit of Jesus or the Holy Spirit on planet Earth. And then more than that, he establishes the first church and he plants, or is at least in, in, uh, partly responsible for planting, the church in Antioch, which becomes the cradle of Christianity. So here's what we have going on. I want you to walk with me as as we look at Peter's absolute failure, um, he, he, probably part of what he is feeling and thinking, and then walk with me and walk with us as we watch Jesus reinstate Peter and lift him from this humble and broken spot, commission and anoint him to be the first pastor of the first church and to go and tell the world. I would actually say that if Peter wasn't deconstructed and at a point of total faith crisis, he would not have been able to surrender his heart fully and let the Lord Jesus resurrect him fully. And so what I want to actually invite even you and I into is um, if you are at a faith crisis, and, and let's just open this up uh, practically for us for a minute before we start reading. Um, faith crises look many different ways. You know what I'm saying? Uh, if you've lost a loved one, uh, if you can't have children, if you're facing financial difficulty, if you've launched a business that doesn't seem to be rising like you hoped it would, if you're in a marriage crisis, if you've got a chronically ill child, if you've lost a parent or a loved one or a brother or a sister, if you've been hurt or abused by the church or a family member, if there are so many reasons why you and I could be in the middle of a faith crisis, and, and I would love to stand here and tell you that you're only going to have one faith crisis in your whole life, and that's the faith crisis that's going to lead you to faith, and from that point on, it's going to be great. But if I'm vulnerable and honest, I keep finding myself at these moments of faith crises. And I think what is probably both humbling and amazing, but also a little bit scary is what if at these points of faith crises where Jesus wants to reconstruct and transform Michael, I say no and get scared and run away. What happens? Or what would have happened uh, to the Apostle Peter on this particular day in John 21 when he sees King Jesus on the beach if he didn't jump out and swim to shore? In other words, what if he saw Jesus on the beach and he was like, I'm too ashamed, I'm too embarrassed, I'm going to turn my boat around and I'm going to sail the other way? You follow me? So you, 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 let's open this door on the, and, and I'm not suggesting as I, anytime I preach the gospel, you're going to have to understand that I believe that God's sovereignty are the bookends to human free will. Okay, So I'm not questioning the sovereignty of God, but I am fully inviting you to wrestle with Peter's free will in this moment. So I want to start before I go into John 21. I'm actually going to read to you Luke Luke 22, if I can find it. 
I'm going to read to you because it sets it up beautifully. Luke 22, verses 31 through 34. If you don't want to turn there, that's fine. Just make a note. But this is Luke 22, verses 31 through 34. And it sets up this faith, faith crisis, I think, that we're beginning to see this morning. So here it goes. This is Jesus talking. And he says, Simon, Simon. Now, who's Simon? Peter. Okay. So, uh, and Peter is Cephas, or the rock. So Simon, Peter. Um, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. What is the sifting? What is part of the sifting? Let's answer it like that. Ask it like that. When the little slave girl looks around him at the fire, why Jesus is being beaten and ultimately crucified, is that part of the sifting? Yes. When it is revealed that Peter, who thought himself probably better than the rest of the disciples because he would follow Jesus to death, suddenly in the face of a little slave girl asking him questions, denies the Christ, is that the sifting? Yes. Okay. That's at least part of it. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Verse 32. But I prayed for you, Simon. Now, who's praying for Simon? I bet some of you don't believe Jesus is praying for you. During your sifting, during your darkest moment, during the moment where you feel most abandoned, most hurt, most worthless, most not seen or known or heard, Jesus is praying for who? that your faith may not fail. So what is indicated even in that? I am praying, I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. Could his faith fail? That is exactly what Jesus is saying. In the bookends of God's sovereignty, under the serious sifting, it is possible, Simon, that your faith fails. Like, go there a second. What if Peter's faith had failed? What if his shame or his guilt or his insecurity or his bitterness or his anger or his frustration or whatever took the best of him and he refused to follow Jesus into all that God had for him? Would he have been the first pastor of the first church? Would he have ushered in Pentecost? Would he have planted the church of Antioch that became the cradle of all Christianity and launched Christianity even as we know it today? Like, go and and drink that for just a second. Now, God and his sovereignty, remember those bookends of his sovereignty, knew, I think, that Peter would choose. But drink this for just a second. Simon, I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, when you've turned back, so is he going to fail for a time? Not just that I've prayed that your faith won't fail in the long term, but FYI, your faith is going to fail in the short term. That's what Jesus is saying to Peter right here. When you have turned back, you get that? There's a turn away from Jesus and then a turn back towards Jesus. I'd propose to you that most of us do this on a daily basis. Just being honest. If your heart's like my heart. Moments of hard-heartedness, moments where we turn, moments where we dislike, moments where we argue, and then moments where we turn back. When you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. So what's the commission? You're going to be sifted. You're going to be tested. Your faith is going to fail. When you turn back, what's the call? Strengthen your brothers. Okay. But he replied, this is Simon Peter's boastful reply, I can't even imagine the Lord of glory, the creator of heaven and earth, standing before me, telling me that my faith is going to fail, that he's praying for me. But when I've turned back to strengthen my brothers, and then Peter boastfully replies, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Bring it on. And Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, I, I, I can't even imagine Jesus' tone of voice in this moment. I don't think it was, um, I don't think there was a bit of sarcasm or contempt or it was probably very gracious. It was probably very kind. I even imagine that Jesus did it in almost a whisper so that nobody else would have heard. But he said, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Okay. Back to John 21. There's two other, I'm not going to, we're not even going to turn here. I'm just going to mention them. If you're taking notes, you can write them down. 
but there's two um, obscure verses um, that are hard to understand that I think go into the whole picture here of what, you, what I want you to see with the Apostle Peter. But it's Luke 24, verses 33 and 34. Make a note of that if you want. Luke 24, verses 33 and 34. And it says, They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them assembled together, saying, It is true, the Lord has risen, and he has appeared to Simon. This is right after Jesus rose from the dead. Now, who did he appear to? Simon. Okay, there's all, another passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 5. That's 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 5. And here's what Paul actually writes. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he, Christ, was buried, raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and then he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Who was Cephas? Peter. Okay, now, here's the, here's the challenge. We have no scriptural recollection or um, recording of Jesus appearing to Peter, except here. So there is this unwritten place where Jesus appeared to Peter. And what I love about the Lord Jesus is I believe, it's my, my conviction, my belief, that the Lord probably appeared privately to Peter. And what do you think he did in the privateness of the two of them that was not recorded? Somebody said it. I think he forgave him. I think there was an intimate encounter that was just between Peter and his Lord, where in humility of heart, Peter recognized what he'd done. He'd recognized the sifting. He recognized his own failure. He recognized his own faith crisis. And he began perhaps just a little bit to receive the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus. So going into this encounter, I would actually say to you, I believe this is the second time that Peter has seen Jesus. Okay, are we ready? All right, let's read. This is John 21, starting in verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? What's he talking about? Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? They got boats around, there's nets around, there's fishing gear around. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Is that what he's saying? Is he saying, do you love me more than your fishing trade? Or is he referencing where Peter boastfully said, not only am I not going to deny you, not only am I not going to fail in my faith, I'll go with you to death in prison. It's, it, it, Peter was braggadociously sort of saying that he was superior towards his other 11 or other 10 apostle brothers. Um, is Jesus referencing, is he looking at the other apostles who probably were now arriving on shore in their boat? He's saying, do you love me more than these? And, and truthfully, I'm not exactly sure. I think he's probably referencing Peter's boastful sort of braggadocious, I'm superior, I'll go with you to death and to prison even if they all fail. So Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Uh, just a, a side note that I'm not going to open here too much, but a lot of people try to translate the love here, the, the, the love word in the Greek that Jesus is using and that Peter's using. And I've tried that. I've tried to preach it that way because they, they go back and forth between the word like and the word love and human language, or the, the English language doesn't have enough words in it um, for us to even understand it that way. But I think mostly what's going on here, I don't, I don't think there's enough theological significance for us to get into translating those words love. I think it's John's unique writing style that comes out here. That's just sort of my personal preference. But yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Now, lambs in the New Testament is a picture of what? Uh, Genesis to Revelation. What are uh, sheep a picture of? Who? What? Me. You. You us, the body of Christ. In the Old Testament, they weren't called the body of Christ. They would have called the, the sheep of God, the children of God. Okay, so feed my lamb. So he immediately understands what? He is to pastor God's people. Lead my sheep. Feed them. Again, Jesus said, remember, this is the same Jesus who said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Okay, again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. 
The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you. I'm going to pause right there before we keep going. Okay, so let's make this really simple. Um, I'm sitting here on the front row. I got, or Josh is on the front row. I'm up here. I go up to Josh and I go, hey, Josh, are we friends? What's Josh going to say? Sure, okay. Hey, Josh, it's good to see you today. Are we friends? Hey, Josh, it's really nice to see you today. Are you and I friends? And, and what's happening inside of him? Is he irritated? Like, what is this guy's problem? I'm going to try this to one of you next Sunday. I'm just going to come. Hi, do you like me? But, but like get in this just a second because Jesus, the Lord of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth, is going to Peter. There's already been some private meeting that we know nothing about. And all of a sudden, Peter, who's warming by this fire, he's shivering. He has all these memories flooding back of everything that he has done, everything he's failed to do, all the miracles that Jesus has done. He's in the middle of the greatest area of Jesus' miracles. And Jesus, the author of life, is sitting there in front of him. And he goes, Jesus, Simon Peter. Peter, do you love me? Now, why three times? Come on. Why three times? Because Peter denied him how many times? Okay, what I love about the Lord Jesus is when a sin or set of sins, and I believe sin is not a behavior, but a condition of the heart, okay? That's a whole nother sermon. But sin is not, you can't like stop a behavior or behaviors and stop sinning. Sin is a condition of the heart that can't be fixed except by going to King Jesus and saying, would you forgive me? And you exchange your brokenness for his resurrection power. That's the sin transaction. So you can't like, you know, old school Christian quit cussing or drinking or smoking or chewing or partying or dancing or whatever it is. You can't quit those things and, and think that I'm no longer a sinner. No, no, no. It, 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 sin is a condition of the human heart. So uh, Peter it, it has had some interaction with Jesus where I believe the sin um, in Peter's heart, there was some, some transference of that sin from Peter um, to Jesus. Jesus' righteousness gets transferred from Jesus to Peter. So Peter is sitting in that. Now, did uh, Peter's sin um, happen publicly or privately? Publicly, okay. Peter's sin happened publicly. So how does Jesus reinstate him? You get that? So you, you deal with sin. This is right from Jesus. You deal with sin in the arena that it was committed. So if somebody does something secretly back here and we find out about it and have to deal with it, do we bring it up in front of the church? No. How do we deal with it? Just privately, we deal with it. In fact, even Peter in this supernatural transaction between him and the Lord Jesus, I'm proposing that he dealt with this sin just between him and the Lord. But Peter um, and his leadership and his anointing to lead, his anointing to be an apostle, anointing is just like a Bible word for like call of God or commission of God on Peter's life um, at some level is now dependent on the public reinstating of Peter. So these disciples are coming to shore. Jesus is sitting around the campfire. Peter is around the campfire. They're eating bread, breaking bread, eating fish, drinking water. Peter's getting warm. Now they're having this conversation. The disciples pull up in the boat and the boat hits the shore. It's a cobblestone beach and the guys begin to get out and they begin to sit around and no one dares whether ask if it's really King Jesus because they're like, is he resurrected? Is he real? Is he here? And they're all sitting around. And then after they've all gotten warm and they've all eaten and they've been fed and they've broken bread together, even re visiting symbolically the broken body of Christ and the resurrected body of Christ. They've eaten together. Then he looks at Peter, and this isn't meant to embarrass Peter. This isn't meant to make Peter feel ashamed. This isn't meant to like make Peter go back or rub his nose in his sin. No, no, no. This is all meant to actually lift Peter. So he says in front of Peter, Peter, or Simon, son of John, do you love me? If you do, be my sheep. And a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? 
Third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And so what what Jesus is living out is an opportunity for Peter to almost revisit and reestablish that he is going to follow Jesus. He is not going to deny Jesus. And this is a public sort of um, uh, recalling or reinstating Simon Peter. Now, before I open up the next thing, I want to um, just share personally for just a minute. I got to stand in this very spot in uh, 2018. I think it was uh, maybe May of 2018, April of 2018. And I, I was unprepared. There's actually a little, um, if you want to Google it, uh, you'd have to Google the Church of the Primacy of St. Peter on Google Maps. Church of the Primacy of St. Peter. I'll take you right to this spot. And there's a little stone jetty that sticks out. The levels of the um, Galilee, the Sea of Galilee were much higher then, so the stone jetty is, doesn't even touch the water anymore, but it doesn't matter. I, I walked out to this stone jetty. I walked out to this cobblestone beach, and I was unprepared for what happened because I got into this moment. I can tell you what I was wearing, and I, got, I, had, my, I had flip-flops on, and I walked all the way down to the water's edge, and the Sea of Galilee is lapping up on my toes, and I recognized in this moment that I had some deep shame and some guilt and like I had failed and I couldn't be used. And all of a sudden I remember standing on the Sea of Galilee and tears start dreaming, streaming down my eyes and I sense the, the, the Holy Spirit saying to me, Michael, feed my it was like this moment where I didn't even know, and, and I'd even been a pastor at, a, at another church for a number of years, and yet I didn't even recognize that there was this deep, lingering sense of shame and brokenness and failure inside of me. And guess what? Some days I still find it. And I have to remember my toes in the water and go, Lord Jesus, and remember that I've exchanged my brokenness for the righteousness of Christ and appropriate the resurrection power of Jesus and remind myself that it's not about Michael or what I failed to do or what I've done or what I'm good at or what I'm not good at or how I look or don't look or blah, blah, blah. No, no, it's about King Jesus in me and through me. But I stood there that day and I, I, it was like the Lord Jesus reinstated me and I'm standing there on the Sea of Galilee. It was early in the morning. The sun was just rising and I got tears streaming down my face and I sensed the Lord Jesus calling me again, even after seven years of ugliness and failure from 19 to 26 in my own life. And he is calling me now, Michael, go and feed my sheep. It's a powerful moment for me. It's a powerful moment. But here's where I want you to begin to make application to your own life. Every single one of us is going to face a number of crises in our own life. A number of challenges, a number of difficulties. And I actually want to, um, I'm, I'm going to pivot off an article that I just read, and then we're going to go back to the text. But um, there's an article I just read by a guy named Tim Keller, and it was fascinating because he proposes, and I've adapted them and shifted them a little bit, but he proposes um, five or six things that precipitates a faith crisis. And he's beginning to talk about sort of the faith crisis in the larger American church, the faith crisis in individual churches, and the faith crisis in... Us as individuals. Okay, so here's, the, here's what he proposes, and we're going to look at it. Hopefully, we're going to wrestle it in, in the life of Simon Peter. I'm going to be vulnerable about the life of Michael, and guess what your job is to do? Look at who? You, that's right. Don't elbow the person next to you. Hold that elbow. Okay, so here's what he proposed. Um, there are, uh, I made six um, faith crises that can happen. Um, when a child is raised in a Christian home, there's a faith crisis that happens. Does God have grandkids? You ever read anything about grandkids in the Bible? What's he have? Children. So a child that's raised in a Christian home has to go through some crises of faith where they go, is God real? Do I doubt? Do I believe? Am I going to walk with him? Am I going to honor him? And usually if you watch a child raised in a Christian home, you got this stutter step where it's like they're walking, they're walking, then it looks like they've lost their faith. And then they're walking, they're walking, it looks like they lost their faith. Okay, This is part of the child growing up, even the teenager, even in the 20s, where you're making this transition from it's my parents parents' faith to its my faith. Okay, so that's a crisis that may precipitate the transformation of Jesus in your own life. Another crisis is suffering and injustice. We could park here for so long, I'm not going to, but when Christians suffer or when we experience injustice, it can result in a crisis of faith. Some of us have gotten hurt by the church. 
Some of us have been part of the church that hurt people. You may not even know that that's part of your story. Some of us have gotten hurt by parents or by aunts or uncles or people we've been abused. But when we as Christians suffer injustice, it becomes a, a, a crisis of faith. Now, let me, let me back up to number one. A child raised in a Christian home. Simon Peter was raised in Bethsaida in a Jewish home. Did he have a crisis of faith? See, everything Jesus was doing in Simon Peter's life fit with the Old Testament, kind of, up until his death and resurrection. And then Peter has a crisis of faith. Okay, second point, suffering and injustice. Is Peter enduring suffering and injustice? Yes. Yes, he is. <clears throat> the third point is that there might be disillusionment with Christian leaders. There's more Christians right now in America turning away from church because of disillusionment and hurt with Christian leaders. Did it happen in the Bible? Is it going to happen today? Yes. The fourth thing that was in this article is disillusionment with yourself. Was the Apostle Peter in this moment feeling disillusioned with himself? Yes. If you've never felt disillusioned or disappointed with yourself, I would encourage you to think through that. The fifth thing that this article offered is, and this is a little bit more uh, difficult, but go here with me because it's powerful, especially for some of you who've been in the church a long time. So hang with me here. Not learning to distinguish between primary and secondary beliefs. What? Is the rapture a primary or secondary belief? Is women in leadership a primary or secondary belief? Is how you vote a primary or secondary belief? When Christians, is how, is whether you believe Christians speak in tongues a primary or secondary? Uh, whether you believe Christians can actively prophesy, primary or secondary? What happens with many Christians is you confuse primary and secondary, and if we're not careful, we actually affix our faith to things that are secondary. We call them primary, and when something happens that calls some of those primary beliefs, what we've called primary beliefs, into question, what happens to us? We end up in a full crisis, and we throw the whole mess out, and we lose our faith. You hear me? So Peter is actually at a moment like this because he is going, um, for him, primary faith was that King Jesus was going to establish himself as king in Jerusalem and overthrow the Romans. Was he right or wrong? He was wrong. He was right that Jesus was going to establish himself as king. So he's in a crisis of faith where he's going, is uh, Jesus really king in the way that I've assumed he was king? So there's assumptions made that if it doesn't look like this or sound like this or seem like whatever this is, that your, your secondary beliefs become your primary thing. And when those get called into question, you crumble and fall. So what I'm always calling us to, and I do my best every week to call us to, is to make the essentials of the faith, your relationship with Jesus, the exchanged life, the surrendered life, the crucified life, the infilling power of, of the Holy Spirit. Those are the essentials to the faith. And there's a lot of different things that we can talk about and interact with and around, and none of those things are bad. But I'm saying as a, as a maturing believer or believers, we must not make periphery issues the center issue. And if you do, we're at risk when those issues come into question or we falter or fail or maybe a leader that we love falters and fails or they get stuck on a particular issue. You're in danger of entering this faith crisis like I believe Simon Peter is sitting at this beach because I think deep in Simon Peter's heart, he's actually harboring this disappointment that God didn't do what he thought God should do, which was go in with a sword and overthrow Rome and overthrow Herod and set up his kingdom and rule and reign from Jerusalem and make Peter his right hand dude. I think that's what's going on inside of Peter in this moment. Um, there's so much there. I'm, I'm going to keep moving, but this, this confusion of primary and secondary beliefs is so, um, it is essential. And please don't hear me say I'm dismissing the importance of these secondary things. I'm, I'm not. I'm just saying what you build your life on is the primary beliefs about who Jesus is. Follow me? Okay. 
And then the last thing is what precipitates a faith crisis. It's living in a faith bubble. You'll see young people a lot of times go to a discipleship school um, or a school of the spirit or a school of something, and they go get inside of a faith bubble. And then what happens when they leave the faith bubble? Come on, what happens? Their faith goes away. None of these things are inherently bad, but what I'm attempting to even point out to you is there is a crisis of faith. Now, I don't like crises, all cards on the table. I don't care for them. I don't like the way they make me feel. I don't like the way they look in my marriage. I don't like the way they look at my family. I, don't, I just don't like them. But here's what I know. If in a crisis, every one of us as Christians is faced with this opportunity to allow the resurrection power of Jesus to lift us up in and through that crisis and to call us, commit us and anoint us to take our heavenly kingdom purpose and place. And if we'll walk with him in and through the crisis, rising through it, allowing him to lift us up, he will send us and it will be used for our good and his glory. Every time. Does that mean you have to like it? I still don't. I wish I did. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. I'm still working on that. So Peter is in this faith crisis, and Jesus is reinstating him publicly. Now let's keep reading. We're in verse 18. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. What's he saying there? You did what you wanted, okay. But when you were old, you thought I was going to tell you something secret, didn't you? Some, <laughs> nope. That's it. You went, did what you wanted. Okay. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. You will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Peter was crucified probably in Rome, probably under Nero legend it's church legend it's not full church history it's church legend but i like it but it says that peter uh, asked not to be crucified right side up because that was the way his lord was crucified he asked to be crucified upside down because he didn't deserve to hang the way jesus hung verse 20 peter turned and he saw the disciple whom jesus loved was following them now who's this John, that's exactly right. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? Verse 21, when Peter saw him. Now, when Peter saw him, um, who, who is Peter currently talking to? Jesus. When Peter sees John, what's he do? All right, Peter's looking at who? Jesus. John comes in or moves closer, and what's he do? Takes his eyes off of Jesus. Now, watch what he says, and we're going to come back to this. When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? And Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple, who? John, would not die. What's interesting is John is the only one of the disciples that wasn't um, martyred. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have the room for the books that would be written. Okay, here's what I want you to get. There is a resurrection um, power that Jesus is extending to Peter in this reinstating process around this campfire. Now, in the end, Peter, is, his feelings are a little bit hurt. He's probably still feeling whatever he's feeling in this moment. And he shifts his focus off of the Lord Jesus on to the Apostle John. I want you to think of a couple things. Um, in Luke 5, verse 8, if you want to cross-reference it, do it. But um, Peter, 
uh, was looking at the Lord Jesus. Jesus tells him to go out into deeper water, cast out your nets, you'll catch many fish. Peter does it. And then Peter shifts his gaze off of Jesus and he says, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. What happens uh, when, Jesus, when Peter shifts his gaze off the Lord Jesus onto John, he begins to compare his life and his ministry and his whatever with who? John. Okay, in, in Luke 5, 8, he shifts his gaze off of the Lord Jesus onto whom? Himself, and he begins to focus on his own sin, his own failure, and his own shortcoming instead of the righteousness of Jesus. Okay, keep going. When Peter is walking on water, it says in Matthew 14, 30, Peter looked away from the Lord and looked at the wind and waves, and immediately he began to sink. So Peter is looking at the Lord Jesus, he's walking on the water, and then what's he do? Looks at his circumstances, his job, his spouse, his yard, his car, his... You hear me? And what happens? He begins to sink. Okay. Similarly, here is what I would say. There's, there's like a, a double dichotomy sort of thing in all of this. Jesus is reinstating Peter. So he's calling Peter up through his failure, out of his failure, through his, his, all that he has done. He is reinstating Peter. He is commissioning him now to go be the pastor of the first church um, in, in the first place the church was in Jerusalem and usher in the, the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and then go plant arguably the most powerful church that is still making waves and affecting our lives today in Antioch. And he, he commissions Peter to be part of this. But then there's also this serious rebuke for Peter in, Peter, if you take your gaze off of me, King Jesus, you will sink. You will begin to fail. You will begin to compare yourself with other people and look what I'm doing or not doing or whatever. And you will, the, the kingdom of God, the presence of God and the infilling power of the Holy Spirit will pass you by. Now, there's a, there's, there's a double thing in here I want you to get. Number one, when you face crisis, you are being sifted. We're being disciplined. If you're in Christ, if Christ is in you, if you're not a believer here today, come up afterwards. I'd love to pray with you. But if you're in Christ and he's in you, when you face crisis, you are being sifted. You may or may not fail. It doesn't really matter what you do, actually. But on the other hand, end of that crisis, if you will allow him, Jesus will lift you up in and through that crisis and establish your feet on his rock and give you purpose and destiny and use it for your good and God's glory. Every time I'm telling you it's gospel from Genesis to Revelation, you can talk to anybody that's walked with Jesus a long time. That's what he does if you let him. Now, do you have an opportunity to turn tail and run? Yes. What if Peter had said no? What if Peter got up from that fire and walked away? What if Peter didn't paddle to that shore? What if Peter didn't come and sit with King Jesus? What if he turned and ran? Would he have lost it? Yes. And then the second thing that I want you to see is that the Lord Jesus gives a firm rebuke here. Peter, keep your eyes on me. Not on your hurt not on your disappointment, not on offenses because they're sure to come, not on financial challenge, not on a spouse that you don't like, not on a kid that you don't like, not on, what do you keep it on? Keep that gaze fixed. And here's what I want you to see as we end this book of John, launching into the book of Acts. This book concludes with Peter and John following Jesus together. Had they not trusted him? Had Peter not been transformed by him? Had, Jesus, had Peter not followed him? They would probably, Peter would probably have remained a successful fisherman on the Sea of Galilee, but the world would never have heard from the Apostle Peter. And instead, he becomes the first pastor of the first church, ushers in Pentecost, plants the church that becomes the cradle of Christianity. Now, here's the pivot into your life and mine. Jesus is still doing this today. Anywhere he finds a believer who will yield to his will, who will listen to his word, who will follow his way, he is doing this. Is Peter still alive with us on earth? No. Is John still alive with us on earth? 
No, you are and I am, and we have an opportunity to take the place of Jesus, to take the place of Peter, to take the place of John on planet Earth, to rise up and in and through and let the resurrection power of Jesus lift us from the broken place where we have lived and allow him to use the crises of faith to reconstruct us or transform us into the likeness and image of Jesus for our good, for his glory, and to transform the world around us. That's worth giving our life to. That's it. <laughs> Stand to your feet. Let's pray. Daniel, I don't know where you are, but I'm going to close this. Let's close our eyes for a second. If as you sit here today, eyes are closed, you'd be willing to say, Michael, I'm at a touch of a crisis. If I'm all cards on the table, I got a thing or two going on in my heart where I went, yeah, it's another faith crisis, Lord. But if you'd be willing to go, Lord Jesus, I've got a little bit of a crisis brewing inside my heart, inside my head. I want to pray for you. So here's what I want to ask you to do, and I realize it's a risk. Would you just stick your hand up? You just say, I've got something. I'm not going to ask you what it is. I'm not going to point it out. I'm not going to call your name out. I'm just going to, it's just between you and the Holy Spirit. If you go, I got something. I got something. Come on. Who else? Let me, I see some hands, but let me see some more. I got a crisis. I got something. I'm sitting around a campfire. I'm remembering what I've done or failed to do. You can put it down once you put it up or if you want to hold it up. Father, I believe this is a church full of people that are called and commissioned with kingdom destiny. Father, I believe this is a church full of people who, while we have failed, while we have been sifted, while we have fallen short, that you've got your gracious hand on us and you've called us and commissioned us to be a group of people that carries King Jesus, that carries the kingdom of God, and that you want to lift us out of those broken places and commission us to be a companion and participant with you in transforming the world around us. Father, I believe that you take busted, broken fishermen off the Sea of Galilee who are short-tempered and impetuous and angry and cuss underneath their breath and you commission them and you change them and you transform them and you fill them with your spirit. And Father, I pray for every person from one side of the auditorium to the other, for every person online, for every person listening in arrears. Lord, I pray that you would raise us up as part of the very body of Christ to be companions and participants with you in receiving the resurrection power of King Jesus and then living it out. Father, I can't help but think that Peter could have said no to being the first pastor of the first church, to ushering in Pentecost, to planting the church in Antioch. He could have said no out of his fear, out of his shame, out of his guilt, because he couldn't deal with the crisis. And instead, he humbled himself, even though he didn't understand. And you raised him up in and through his crisis. And Father, I pray for every person who's listening to the sound of my voice, that you would call us and raise us up through our crises, using our crises to reconstruct us, to transform us, to allow us to be carriers of the very presence and purpose of God. Father, here we are. Send us. Lord, touch every person whose hand went up. Touch every person whose heart went up but hand didn't. Father, may we know you more fully. May we become progressively more intimately and deeply acquainted with you. And Father, as we shift into the book of Acts, would you awaken us with the destiny that you've called us to. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.